evening. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled select board, town, uh, Berlin uh, Town Select Board to uh, order for Monday, February the 6th, 2023. With us tonight is, Flo, uh, to my left, is Flo Smith and Joe Staub. To my right is Carl Parton. With us also is Vince Connie, Town Administrator, and Diane Isabel, Town Treasurer. Uh, any um, additions or changes to the agenda? Yes, there are tonight. Um, for the appointments, we've added Mr. Kelly, who came in uh, after the agenda was posted, uh, expressed his interest to be on the Economic Development Committee as well. We have some uh, additional liquor licenses that are in your package, liquor and tobacco, that have come in to be approved after the, the minutes were posted, and also the addition of an executive session to talk about contracts. Okay. Um, public comment? Hearing none. Um, appointments of Wayne Lamberton, Roberta Haskin, Pat McDonald, Diane Isabel, and Pete Kelly to the Economic Development Committee. Are you muted? No. <laughs> I move that uh, we accept the appointment of the one, two, three, four, five mentioned, aforementioned individuals to the Economic Development Committee. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for your service, Pete. <laughs> Thank you. Inverberg. Uh, okay. So uh, just on that note, since there's two here, I'd just like to mention that I'll reach out. To, to each of you to set up a, an initial meeting, give you an idea of where we are, some of the things going on, and, and kind of what we're, we're looking at, hopefully, to uh, to move forward together. So, thank you. And Diane as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. You've got a Berlin all-star team there. So. <laughs> very exciting. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, the Beaver Baffle request by yes. Skip Lyle. Let's yep. He's Skip Lyle. He's online. Um, he came in to uh, answer any questions uh, in regards to uh, what we get on that. So I know the board had requested that, so he's here tonight. On the on the Beaver Baffles. If they're not successful, or they have, or the maintenance is is unrealistic, what happens to them? Well, I don't build them. <laughs> I don't build them that way. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've been doing this for decades, and uh, and my goal has always been to to build really high quality devices. The general term I use is flow device. And the reason, you know, one of the reasons I do that is, is because I don't want there ever to be a, a need for constant maintenance. So I, I try to design that out um, so that they're very high quali quality. They're, they're made for the long run. You know, not only do they have to, to uh, essentially sneak water away from beavers, which is a big challenge, but they have to uh, survive the elements in a, in a very harsh environment. So uh, extreme, extremely durable and effective and, and, and uh, if I do say so myself, a great investment. <laughs> um, can, you, can you tell us uh, about a success story you've had with, with these? Uh, what's uh, a location that you've had one of these and, What's the longest one has lasted without oh. having to be maintained or repaired? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I've I've worked at you know I've been doing this almost thirty years. I've worked at thousands of sites around the world. Um, I think to 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 are you guys there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, my my screen just changed. Um, Interestingly enough, the, the the site, and it's not the same flow device because I've I've updated it um, over the decades. But when I was in my teens here on, on the property I'm living at now in Grafton, Vermont, 
I built my first fence. Let's call it a simple fence on, on the town road culvert. And uh, that's now my family has protected that site now for, for uh, well, well over 50 years. So that's, I, I believe that's a, a, a world record. Um, the town has not had to put a penny into the, the site in, in that time. And as a result of not having to kill the beavers, um, we have just wonderful wildlife filled wetlands on our property. Um, and then I'll, I'll mention a couple other sites because when I first started this, I had gone to college at the University of Maine and, and right, at, right after college in 1995, I got a job for the Penobscot Indian Nation. And so that's when I began my professional flow device career. They have about 130,000 acres and they had a huge problem with beavers. And over the years, that's, that's when I first coined the, the uh, phrase beaver deceiver, which is the name of my products. And, uh, and so we developed some very good products there. And, and we had, by 2000, we had probably been the first large landowner in the world to, to completely uh, beaver proof our, our property non-lethally. So that that was a big success story, and that's you know they've they've uh, saved enormous amounts of money, and and again indirectly created a great deal of you know of the best wildlife habitats there are really are uh, are these beaver flowages as a term I use for beaver created wetlands, and then uh, my 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 own town of Grafton has been beaver proof for um, you know since the early part of this century. Um, it's, it's again, saved a ton of money. Another example um, would be, it's on my website and there's a, a little bit of a case study done. You, you'll see it's called the Andover case study uh, in New Hampshire. And, uh, and we, we essentially beaver proof that town too. And, and they, you know, using some of their old records, oftentimes these figures are not, you know, not good figures on what, what the beaver issue is costing a town aren't really kept but they had some pretty good pretty good figures and say so estimated the you know, the, the amount of money they've saved and will save over the years uh, switching from a lethal to a non-lethal defense and and just I, I, i'll i'll end my answer there and i just wanted to say uh, a little bit about the beaver human conflict um it's it's restricted to beaver damming habitat which is low gradient areas on small streams that's a very small percentage of the landscape, especially in a mountainous a state like Vermont. So what that means is you only have a handful of chronic conflict points, you know, in almost every town. It's, it's just a handful. And so you can eliminate the conflict entirely on town roads with, with, with high quality flow devices very quickly. And, uh, you know, I could do it alone in, in a couple of weeks and, and protect you for many decades and, and essentially end the problem. Whereas a, a, a lethal defense, you'll have you'll have re, repeat conflicts, and it's always it's almost you know usually culverts as you know, but you'll have repeat conflicts at the same site over and over and over again, you know down through the decades, and so one conflict point essentially turns into scores of them. So, I'd be glad to take the next question. <laughs> I see that there's no opt out on this uh, on the, your uh, memorandum of understanding here. I I don't I don't have a memorandum of understanding. Oh. That, that may be somebody else's. This is the protect our wildlife. That's going to contribute. I got you. Percent of the cost. I got you. I, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing. We we live in a we still have an economy here where where you can do so much, especially maybe in rural areas, based on tr just trust. And, you know, I do that with almost every contractor, you know, I hire. And so I, I very rarely have the need for formal contracts. And, and it, it's worked incredibly well over the decades. Okay, so you're just providing the, 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 the uh, beaver deceivers for the for this um, save our wildlife or protect our wildlife yeah uh, group so 
how does um let me think how to say this how how does how does it work if if there's a problem or if there's if there's still a problem with the beavers at these uh choke points who who takes care of it i do yeah all they're doing is you know they um, you know, obviously are interested in non-lethal remedies. So they, they just support my work sometimes. Um, but I'm, I'm always responsible for the quality of my work. And, you know, I have, I have, you know, many, many, many different, different types of clients in different places. And uh, it's always that way. But the thing, you know, and so, yeah, your best guarantee is just <laughs> hiring somebody and I, I I don't mean to toot my horn, but it's, it's just hiring somebody who's really good, who's who's, who's going to do a really solid job, and and uh, and those people are very rare. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is that that um, a kill defense, um, you know, some of your sites in town, you may have been killing the beavers, you know, for you know decades since the first beavers came back, because it's it's usually the same those same culverts in the same places in beaver damming habitat that are, that are problems. And so a kill defense is the only, the, well, it, it guarantees that you'll never solve the problem. You know, it's, it, it can be a very good short-term remedy, but it's a very poor long-term remedy. And so, you know, a, 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 what I call a fixed defense, just something in place to prevent that culvert from being clogged you know whether you have beaver beavers there or not for, you know, for a long time is is really a a a, a much better guarantee of a of a of a sol of solving the problem. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Um, hi, this is Joe Stop. Uh, you're talking about little little or no maintenance. What what kind of maintenance may we encounter, or is that something you would encounter? Yeah, um, well, that's that's a good question, Joe. It's a little hard to answer because every site is different, um, especially a culvert site. Everyone's different. The watershed size is, is different. You know, the substrate, the topography, a lot of different variables. But generally speaking, so I have to I have to speak in gen gen generalities. Um, you know, there's there's very little maintenance. You know, every now and then you know, there may be a problem. I mean, there's things things that happen that are not even associated with the beavers, like massive floods that can take out roads and take out beaver deceivers at the same time, things like that, that, I mean, that's, that's beyond my, my control. But it, in terms of just the beavers themselves, it's, uh, it, it'll be, it'll be, I'll, I'll try to design, eliminate um, maintenance requirements to the greatest extent that I can. And, uh, that, I don't know how else to say it, but it's, you know, if you don't do that again, you're going to have, you'll, you'll never have a clog culvert again with a beaver deceiver. But if you don't do it, you're guaranteed that you're going to routinely have a clog culvert. And that, that, that often translates into a, a great deal of maintenance um, costs. So each site is designed specifically for the site. Yeah. And yeah. Do you take into account flood events? I take into account everything, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I try to design for everything. I, I mean, you know, it, it may come as a surprise, but one of the biggest environmental threats is acidic water. And because it, it dissolves raw steel very quickly. So I, the, the only steel that I use in the water, steel mesh, it, it's, it's heavy gauge. And it'll all be epoxy coated and uh, from the factory. And then in addition to that, I spray every spot weld because they don't they don't do a great job getting the spot welds at the factory. So that's a really critical um, uh, factor in terms of surviving the environment. But then I, you know, here's another example. Um, so let, let me just quickly describe what a beaver deceiver, the typical beaver deceiver looks like at a culvert. It's, a, it's an initial fence um, to, to prevent the beavers from directly clogging the culvert. And then, but that's not enough typically because the beavers could build a big dam around the fence. So that's almost always um, 
uh, has a what I generically call a pipe system with it. And, and that's where all the deceiving takes place, a big, well-designed, sophisticated pipe system with what I call a filter on the end of it. To, and that's how you sneak water away from beavers, control damming behavior. And so, um, so, so anyway, so I'm just try, trying to paint a little picture here. So you have that, what I call, I call the, the, the fence and I call it a receiver fence because it receives the pipe system. So when, when, when you have a massive flood and I've, I'm a, I've been in New England, I was, I'm a Vermonter and I've been in New England my whole life. So I, I know how that, I know about massive floods. Um, I never want my flow device to be the limiting factor. I always want it to be the culvert. And so I, I try to, um, I, I don't build the receiver fence any higher than I have to, because I, in, during a big flood, I want the water pouring over the top of that fence uh, long before it pours over the, the uh, top of the road. Um, and then, of course, you know, another big threat is, is the force of ice. And so I, I just build, I use wooden frames and I, 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 I brace them up really well. And uh, yeah, the, I, I, I've, I have flow devices in northern Alaska and, you know, northern Maine and lots of lots of cold places and, you know, they've held up fine. I'm curious, like, how they gonna work when they go backwards? I've seen them go up the bottom side of a culvert just because the top side's got a fence around it. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. It's um, <laughs> yeah, boy, you have to think of everything in this when you're dealing with beavers in this harsh environment. But um, you know, probably ninety five percent or something of the damming efforts occur on the upstream side. So, so that's the side that you really have to have a sophisticated flow device on. But you know, sometimes I'll put uh, I'll do something on the downstream side. Um, you know, it, it can be much simpler and it, it's not a threat at every site, but I'm, I'm very uh, aware of that possibility. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't, I will never use like a, a full vertical fence because I, I don't, and so oftentimes I'll use sort of a horizontal fence that I kind of arc o over the culvert because I, I don't want to put anything vertically in that's going to catch debris and impede the the, uh, the capacity of the culvert. And so, but but that's usually enough to discourage them from coming up. And then the water flows underneath that arced, horizontal arced piece of fencing. So I'll definitely um, take that into consideration, let's say. My other question is, you keep talking about culverts and stuff. Have you looked at where they're, they're looking to install these projects? Because one of them isn't even a culvert, it's an arch arch bridge yeah yeah. Bridge that's yeah 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 30 feet and then you have two five foot culverts side by side with a watershed yeah. the size of a pond yeah 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 thanks for pointing that out um you know i just use that as shorthand um an another way i i another phrase i use which is a little less simple is is uh, I, I i divide damming sites into two categories narrow man-made outlets which can be, you know, bridges, culverts, overflows on man-made dams. And it's, it's mostly culverts. It's mostly road culverts. And then what I call regular beaver dams, dams that are away from narrow man-made outlets. And I, so I've worked at uh, virtually every type of, of uh, outlet or culvert or, um, there is, including, you know, concrete bridges and, and huge culverts and little culverts and everything in between. So I, I'm very, you know, I, one advantage to, to having a lot of experience and working a lot of different sites is I, I'm very, very um, adaptable or adaptive. So I, you know, and, that, and that's a critical, um, a qu critical quality to, to maximize your success rates so, because, you know, the, a regular beaver dams are pretty consistent. But every culvert site is very different. And so you have to, again, you know, as I've said, you really have to mold mold the design to fit the the uh, you know individual characteristics of a of a culvert or bridge site. And and another, I mean, probably the biggest challenge 
or, 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 or things get more expensive and more difficult as watershed size increases because you have to you have to scale your of course you know that's often reflected in the size of a bridge or the size of a culvert and so that then you have to scale your device for that it has to be bigger uh, accordingly do you know what the what the or have you looked into what the water flow is to those culverts no no i i i've worked so many sites you know <laughs> I, I can I I just I I can adapt to anything, you know, I can I can do it. And and if if it's a if it's now every now and then, I mean the only time I I sort and it's very rare that I I might recommend against a flow device is in is when it's um, a beaver dam in a massive watershed, and and then I say, you know I I know that this dam's just going to blow out the next time you have some heavy flows. And so you don't you don't need a flow device there, but uh, it, it's it's rare if ever that I say that um, regarding a culvert, because um, even in a giant watershed, it, if a beaver clogs a big opening, a big culvert or a small bridge, then the, the dam is kind of wedged in there, and it can it can survive a mass a big you know a really big flow. Um, often much better than say a, a, a so-called regular beaver dam, but you know anyway, it's, I, I don't expect to, to come to a site I, I can't do. But um, but the bigger they are, it might just cost a little more. Skip uh, Dave Sawyer, I just had a question. I had looked at some of your on your website in the wood. What is the wood you're using for? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for for checking that out, Dave. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a uh, an old carpenter, <laughs> so I don't I I uh, woods as you all know wood, woods a wonderful building material. I, I wouldn't use anything else. Um, but having said that, I use a couple different kinds, and uh, uh, when if it's out of the water, uh, well, let me take a step back. Um, all my framing is in is uh, almost all my framing are two by fours. If it's out of the water, then I use pressure treated. If it's underwater, then I use spruce, uh, kill dried spruce, because under the water wood decays extremely slowly, and so you don't you don't need to have that that uh, defense against uh, organisms that'll that'll uh, erode it away. And what was your total cost for these uh, baffles? Every site's different. And I haven't given, I, you know, I don't know how many you're contemplating doing in your town. So I, I haven't given you a total price. Right. Yeah. But I, I'd be glad to do that. <laughs> if you if you get a sense of, you know, you know, how many sites you'd like to do, and then then I can I can come check them out and give you a, a quote. Well, I think it was what was it? it was this it was the one out here the the double culvert and the one over on uh, Mirror Lake Road. Right. One's a... So right. see, Mirror Lake Road is a thirty foot arch, aluminum arch, and the uh, one out here on the pond on the discharge from the pond is a uh, is it two five foot culverts side by side. Those are definitely above average, well, well above average, you know, yeah, in terms of size and watershed size and flow device size. So, yeah, it'd be a bit more, but you know, if 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 you know, if I can get a package together and do several sites in in your area, then that you know, then I can bring the price down a little bit. If it's just one site, then I you know, it's more difficult for obvious reasons. Yeah. Mobilization. Um, any other questions for? Uh... Uh, for uh, oh, that Skip. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I'm doing that all day, every day. <laughs> so, any other questions for Skip? So, I guess the, the, the question is do we want to take and have him come and give an estimate on this? 
I think you need an estimate to even yeah. consider proceeding with that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it would help to, you know, if, if you guys can decide, you know, how many sites you'd, you'd like to do. I, I mean, I, I'll tell you, just to get your heads wrapped around it, last year in Vermont, in, in, in areas close to home here, and again, every site's different, but they're, they averaged around four grand per site. And, uh, you know, half of that's materials, um, roughly. So it might be a little more than that if you have really big watersheds. It might be a little, you know, not much more if, if, if you can put together a package and want to do several sites. So that would help me to know, you know, know, know if you're, if you'd like to do more than more than one, certainly. I, I mean, the sooner you the sooner you protect them, the sooner you're going to start saving money. So, if you can come up with a box, it's it's good to get it done quickly. See, the, those are the two sites that bother the most. Yeah. It's only been this year. Yeah. Hmm. So I guess again, it's a question: of what, what does the board want to do here? Do we want to take and and pursue this, or do we want to take and drop it? Your motion? Yes, no. Well, I, I don't know about committing to the two. I, I think you know you do have one that's probably more bothersome than the other. Is that true? They're about the same. About the same. Okay. Hmm. Just because I, you're not committing to anything. It's just going to come down and give you a price. Right. Is it a free estimate? Yeah. That would be the are your estimates free? <laughs> I get myself into a lot of trouble because sometimes I go into it just assuming I'm going to get the job, you know, and then it's, then I don't, you know, I often don't charge for that, but I got to be careful there because it's a lot of driving, a lot of time. So, but if you're pretty, if you're pretty, comp, if you're pretty confident, you might hire me for a, a couple of flow devices, then, then, then I'll do it for free. Well, the only thing is, I mean, we got how much time do you spend digging those out, Tim? We had to do all, I say three of them because there's two of them out here, but both both places, less than an hour. And how many times did you go out there? Three. And did I hear Four. you say that this year was the only year that's been a problem? Yes. On Mirror Lake Road. Uh, yeah. Out here has been it's been continued. Off and off. Ongoing. Yeah. It can go two or three years and they won't touch it. And then all of a sudden they'll go at it for a year and then they might not touch it again for two or three more years. And that's Mirror probably Lake, because you, you Mirror Lake is the first year that's they've done that out there, to my knowledge, but that color is not that very well. So those years of quiet, quietness of non-building is based off of um, removal of those beavers as well as yeah. I couldn't answer to that because I don't know prior knowledge to whether they were trapped out of there you know what I mean that's the first time they've touched it in the almost four years that I've been here and I, I I could do a little research to find out what was done in the prior years that they've been in there but, this this summer was a drought year too, with uh, low rainfall. So probably so the beavers would have carried away worked a little right, harder to find water and, and dam more, well. right? Yeah, yeah. But they, you know, if any of you guys that are perused my website, I guess you you probably know where I'm coming from. But keeping live beavers in the ecosystem has, a, you know, really a lot of values for a lot of wildlife too. They're, you know, it's hard to quantify those values, but they're really significant and real. And so it's, it's always better if you can, you know, not to uh, eliminate, eliminate beavers, but not always possible. I understand that. Well, apparently we're not having luck eliminating them. <laughs> the problem there is that it's, just, it's such a vast area i don't even know what the acreage of that pond is but i bet it's over 200 acres yeah you know what i mean it's like searching for a needle in a haystack and then for, yeah yeah 
Yeah, and beavers are, you know, they, they may be a slow moving animal, but they are great explorers of the landscape. They're always looking, and, and one of the things they're looking for, well, there are two, two things that are really attractive to them, a good damming site, and then because they're territorial animals, they're, they're often also looking for a vacant habitat. And so a, a kill strategy, you know, sort of um, makes, the, makes the area more attractive to dispersing beavers. So, yeah, you know, I know it's, it, it, it's often an intermittent problem. You know, they may go away for a while, they may get killed, whatever, whatever the case may be, but that, that trend, it'll go on. In, in perpetuity, you know, and, and, and over the decades that gets, that can get really expensive. And uh, the, so the Andover case study, you'll get some sense of that. And, and there's been other people, there's a woman by the name of, excuse me, Stephanie Boyles, who did a, a very detailed study of, and it was my work. I did over 40 flow devices at the, at the turn of the century um, for the state of Virginia. And she she did a very detailed study of that. I think it's if you want to Google it, if you Googled Stephanie Boyle's 2002, I think her paper would come up. And so the I, I, the, the state you know has saved millions of dollars. The Penobscots have probably saved a million dollars over the you know now over the decades. My town has saved tens or, or hundreds of thousands. I mean so, yeah. Oh, you know, a few, you know, as you guys know, <laughs> a few decades goes by pretty fast. And is the, uh, is so the saving, those savings will really add up. Yeah. Is, is the savings from your perspective, maintenance of the potentially yeah. clogged? Yeah, clogged, uh, yeah that's, yeah. yeah, that's primarily it. Yeah. You know, this is so frequent that road crews have to go out and, and clean a clean culverts. And, you know, sometimes that can get pretty uh, difficult, say, if a beaver really clogs it in the middle of the culvert, and then you have to, you know, you may have to ramrod it, and you may have to do it every day, every week until you kill the beavers, and, you know, so that's really the the big and most obvious cost, but then there's, you know, clearly there's, you know, this other cost I mentioned that is rarely appreciated or or quantified, and that's, you know, if whatever ecological values are lost by by eliminating this this uh, you know extremely valuable native um, keystone species from the environment, but but that that's not in, that's not part of any of these studies. That's just that's just a, a big part of my thinking. They're they're all just quantifying the you know the maintenance costs. The, and so Andover, Stephanie Boyles are are big ones. Um, you know I think there's a there's a fellow in Massachusetts by the name of Mike Callahan at Beaver. A, a company called Beaver Solutions. I actually, um, I was he was a protege of mine, and he did a, he did a similar study too that you probably find on his website, you know. But it, it, as long as it's a high quality flow device, you can't. It'll pay for itself many many times over again, and really quickly, um, because uh, culverts are beaver magnets. There really are. They're, they're such ideal damming sites. There's never been anything like that, like that on the landscape. And that's state when they have an ideal, you know, a, a road is essentially a giant man-made dam with a little tiny hole in it. You know, so that's just couldn't be a better damming site for beavers than that. So this is a question for our maintenance uh, people here, not you, Skip. But uh, is there any? Um, cost or potential danger for allowing the beavers to stay there as far as the backflow flooding in, in the locations where we're looking to potentially have a baffle. Uh, in other words, are there property owners or, or houses, especially here on, on this road, that are can be adversely affected if the beavers are allowed to stay and the backflow floods onto their property? That's out of Mirror Lake Road. The city of Montpelier owns that whole valley for well back in the north. So, no. I mean, it's not going to affect them at all. It isn't usable property. There's nobody there. No. There's that. And then out here, I don't, you know, I mean, we don't let it get too high out here. But if it backed up into there, 
I think it's been mostly back into the state right away. And maybe um, the gentleman out here with the brick house, I think he owns that back field. I don't know if it get that high to get into his field or not. I have a question for you, Skip. This is Joe Stobb again. Do you, when you build these dams, do you kind of control the, the water level that's allowed by the beavers? Um, I guess that depends depends on the site again. Um, I'd say every regular beaver dam I do, yes. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, you, you, I'm, you, the, the system has to sort of tie into a beaver dam. So you, you need the beaver dam. So you're, you're controlling it. Um, whereas at, at most culvert sites or all culvert sites, it's not acceptable to have a dam in the culvert, you know? So even if you have a, you know, a nice pond there because you have a clogged culvert, that's got to go. That, that just goes. So, so I'm not, you know, every now and then I'll come to a site that really lends itself to a roadside wetland. And I will, I will encourage the beavers to dam out in front of the culvert in an, in an arc. Um, I still have to protect the culvert, but it's a, it's a great, and, and, and there's several examples here in Southern Vermont where they, the town then uses them as a fire pond. So it, in fact, it's one in my own town. So a roadside wetland on a quiet road that, that in a road that's relatively high can be a, a real opportunity. And it's a great place to view wildlife. Um, but, you know, 95% of the culvert sites, it's just, I, I don't do that. And I'm just preventing any damning behavior at all. So at, at the culvert. But I hope that helps, Joe. Well, I, I think it does. I, so the question or discussion around the table was, with the water, with the beaver dam, um, allow the water to back up onto property owners? So I think you have some control there with, with this. Yeah. Dam. Yeah. Yeah. At a site like that, I'm, I'm trying to prevent the growth of a beaver dam yeah. entirely. So, but if, if you, if you get a big flood or a big, a big flow, you know, at some time, if you, if it, with an unprotected culvert and there's a beaver dam in it, then, you know, then you have problems and, and every now and then that'll cause a road to blow out. Um, so that's a big part of that, you know, so in some of those studies, like the Virginia study, I think they, you know, they, they had experienced a few of those. And so they can, you know, you can quickly spend a hundred, hundred grand or something when that happens. So just for the sake of kind of moving this forward, um, do we want to table this, do some further research, maybe get an estimate from Mr. Lyle and then uh, put it back on the agenda? I think that'd be the wise thing because I mean we're not basically what we're discussing is whether or not the, the beetle the beaver uh, receiver would work, and if we're going to go forward for it, we're going to have to have a firm price, right? So it'd be a matter of figuring out: do you want to do just uh, cross town, or do you want to take and do cross town in Silver? I think I'll Mayor Lake with Tim and see, yeah. you know, we know we have two sites for sure. Do we have a third one somewhere maybe that want to be considered in that? And then I'll work with Mr. Lyle, um, tell him what we're looking at and invite him down to take a look and, and give us a cost estimate if he's willing to at that point. And then I'll put it back on the board's agenda after we, we have a price. Well, see, this thing, one of the things that appeal, that, that does appeal to me about the, the baffle is that it, you, you're continuing the flow of the water if you allow the beavers to dam it up and then the dam blows out, it's the surge that would be problematic. Right. Because that's going to affect people downstream, not upstream. So, consensus here? Have uh, Vince uh, go forward with this? I myself am inclined to table it futuristically, maybe a few years out when money is um, not quite so tight as it is now per se, and continue with the normal maintenance and what those folks do for us when we have issues. But that's my own, my own take on it. I really appreciate your presentation, Skip, and I think what you do 
is <laughs> most likely wonderful, oh. but I'm just not at a point where no. I'm on board with doing this right yeah. away. Well, you guys will have to take a vote, obviously. Absolutely. Anyway. Oh, I appreciate what you guys are but doing. I thank too. you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I thank you. I was on a select board here in Grafton for two terms, so I know what a lot of work it is, and so good, for, good for you guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Yeah. Okay. Should I uh, punch out now? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's no other questions for Skip. Yeah. And I'll be in touch with you, Skip. One okay. Way. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for having me, guys. Thank nice. you. Thank nice you. To, nice to see you in action and um, a lot of good questions. Okay, see ya. Yep, yep, bye. bye now. Okay, next on the agenda is uh, Dodge Farm Road. Okay, so in your package, I did, uh, I did put together a bit of a summary uh, of events to get us where we are um, today. From the last visit, well, actually, um, back in October of 21, when the discussion started, I just put some summaries summary together there of the events and the meetings and, and the results thereof to try to summarize it to get you back up to speed for the discussions at the bottom then there's a bit of a uh, recommendation for discussion and, and hopefully a decision hmm. So they haven't done anything from when we inspected it last summer. No. Correct. Okay. Correct. <laughs> So motion to accept the recommendations listed at the at the bottom of this summary. Is, is that what we're looking for? Uh, well, it's it's entirely up to the board. I'm just looking for discussion on this and then, you know, yeah, basically a board decision on how we want to proceed. Could I hear what the recommendation is? Yeah, this is the same one. I, I believe you and, and Ray were copying of this. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it went out. But a time of help. Ray, Ray said he was going to be here tonight as well. You told me he was going to go to call in. There is a 806. I, I'm in here if you're looking for me. Okay, great. <laughs> so you have seen the, the, uh, the recommendations, right, Mr. Sear? Yes, I have. Okay. All right. So they did go. So I, I've got a question just out of curiosity here because I'm reading this where we're planning on to grade the road immediately after mud season to see if there's enough uh, material on the top. If there isn't, who's paying to bring the material in to build that crown up? I think that there's some statements in there that we're looking for agreement on that on that cost as well. In the, in the, right. I see the I see the one as far as when it goes to plow uh, to paving, but I'm not seeing where that costs to bring those that crown up. Am I missing right it? There. Right there. Right there. I would say that's the praise that captures it. You know, I had a quarter inch per foot crown uh, 
uh, as uh, mandated under A76, you've, you've at least got that on that road right now. You don't have to have it crowned so that it looks like a ring. So can we make a motion to uh, accept the road uh, with the stipulations listed in this document without reading the whole uh, six paragraphs or? That's, a, that's my motion. <laughs> so you wanted to uh, accept the summary is what you're saying. Thanks, Eric. To have the town accept, uh, accept the road as listed and with the stipulations. Um, I don't know what those... I'm willing to read it as well if anyone wants to yeah, read, it read it in its entirety. Yeah, read it into the record. Yeah, I... I'm going to read it into I'm the record. Said... Hello? Did you want to say something, Ray? No, no, I, 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 no, I just I kind of like to hear what those stipulations are. Go ahead, please. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and read that into the record. Based on all discussions in the history of events, the following recommendation is presented for discussion and decision. The town should accept the road with the following stipulations. As per the original request, the town is only accepting Dodge Farm Road and not Waterworks Way. This point is up to where the previous existing cul-de-sac was located. The, the town still has the agreed right-of-way access across Waterworks Way to access the well field and has no obligation or responsibility there other than the current agreement of plowing and sanding. HOA accepts the terms of the policy, town policy section 12, which states, when the road has been completed and accepted, the town may begin normal maintenance for 12 months. After 12 months of maintenance, if no serious defects have been observed, the deed will be recorded and the road will become a town highway in accordance with provisions 19 BSA chapter seven. During the 12 month initial acceptance period, any flaws or defects which are pointed out to the developer or owners will be their responsibility to correct. During this period, the town will order and erect the necessary signs. In addition to the above, the town agrees to work in good faith with the owner's HOA of Dodge Farm Road to agree to any additional costs that may occur with any and all issues that may arise during this period. The town will start its 12 month maintenance on March 1, 2023 to capture mud season. The town plans to grade the road immediately after mud season to determine if there is enough top course material since that is still in question. In addition, during this grading, the town will address the concerns still existing regarding the lack of crown in the road. The town also plans to remove grass berms from the roadside during this time to address additional water runoff concerns. The town does not accept any liability or ownership implied or otherwise regarding underground cabling that is installed as there are agreed areas where it was not able to be installed to town standards. The town will not pave this road for at least 10 years unless the board decides it is the best interest of the town to do so. Should residents request to be paved, prior to March of 2034, they will agree to pay half the cost to do so. Yeah. Is that your motion, Carl? Yep. Um, you have a second? I'll second. Okay. Yes, Roberta. First, in addition to the waterworks way spur, Dodge Farm Road also spurs a little bit past the roundabout. And you may want to address that in, in, in our previous discussions, the town was not going to take that over because there's no place for the no turn uh, truck to turn, trucks to turn around. Do you want to include that in this, that, that portion is not going to be the town road? As a, a so I, I homeowners think. association, we already, had discussed it and knew that wasn't going to happen. That was I, not going to remain. I, I think that's the way that's written. It's yeah, it's just, that just, just a roundabout. Just to where the cul-de-sac existed. Okay. okay. I, I think that's the way it is. It's written. 
do that because I think Ray had mentioned that to me as well. Yeah, that was written. Waterworks Way crosses over lot number nine. Yeah. And then Dodge Farm Road continues up to two or three more houses, two, two or three more driveways. Yeah. But it's very, it's, it's 700 feet. Yeah, thing. it's not wide enough to be a town road. Yeah. All right, so that's it. It terminates at the cul-de-sac. Yep. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Come in, Roberta. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Um, the Vermont Declaration of Inclusion Discussion Decision. Yes, I believe we have Mr. Coleman online. We'll present that. Mr. Coleman, can you hear us? You're on mute if you can hear us. Norm, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to just introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Bob Harner, who was the founder of this uh, initiative, the Declaration of Inclusion Initiative, and ask him to speak for a few minutes. Then he's got another presentation to make, and I'll try and fill in the gaps. All right. Thank you, Norm. Uh, as Norm said, my name is Bob Harner one of the founders of the uh, Inclusion Initiative. And um, <clears throat> uh, we are, you know, we're just here to say a few words about an initiative that we think is important to Vermont and every town in it. We are here to talk about a simple statement by the leadership of a town that they want their town to be an unbiased place where everyone is made to feel they belong. But it only works if the leadership of the town leads the way and sets an example of being unbiased and respectful of all residents and urges citizens to model similar behavior. So what is that statement uh, that we're talking about? I think the, the select board members, I, I think have uh, a copy of it in their packet, but for, for uh, others who may be present, uh, I will read it. it. It's quite short. The town of Berlin condemns racism and welcomes all persons regardless of race, uh, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, identity, or expression, age, or disability, and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all its forms, commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community, and will strive to ensure that all our actions as a town, uh, policies and operating procedures reflect this commitment. The town of Berlin is and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinion. So to give a little history, I first heard of the Declaration of Inclusion from my cousin, who was chair of the select board in uh, Franklin. Um, <clears throat> Franklin adopted the declaration in September of 2020. And my town of Pittsford, just north of Rutland, adopted it a few weeks later, and then Brandon adopted. At that point, I began to think of this as a statewide effort. And I recruited Norm Cohen, who is with us tonight, and Al Wakefield to join me. So we are three octogenarians on a mission to make Vermont more diverse and the economy of the state more dynamic. Towns in your area that have acted affirmatively on this are uh, Moortown, Randolph, Richmond, Hardwick, Barry City, St. Johnsbury, East Montpelier. 
and 86 other towns and cities. These 93 municipalities representing nearly 60% of Vermont's population that have adopted a statement saying that they want their town to be more inclusive and unbiased. And to give a little history, which you, you all know, that the United States has a long-standing tradition of welcoming people from all over the world. Our Statue of Liberty is the symbol of our willingness and our eagerness for diversity in our population. This diversity is what makes us strong and a model for the world. So we suggest that being inclusive is the morally right thing to do. But for Vermont, for Vermont, it is also the economically urgent thing we need to do. As a select board, you know the importance of looking ahead three years, five years, 20 years, to think about the way you want your town to evolve. As a state, Vermont must look ahead too, because based on the 2020 census, we know that Vermont's population growth is stagnant and the average age of Vermonters is increasing. And we are losing our younger people to opportunities out of state. This does not bode well for the long-term economic vitality of the state. We need to grow the population. In our town, in our towns and statewide, and one way to do this is to put out the word that Vermont is a welcoming, respectful place for all, where newcomers will be respected, included, and encouraged. So with that sort of prelude, I, I turn it back to Norman, uh, who will give more uh, details about our, our, the, our significant allies in this effort. and. Um, and, and, and what we think of as the future. Well, well, thank you, Bob. And again, thank you, you folks for letting us uh, join the meeting tonight. Um, last year, CNBC conducted a survey and the survey results were very interesting. Vermont was considered and established and recognized as the best place in the United States, the best state in the United States to live. Uh, I know that, Bob knows that, you know that. And I, I'm I'm a flatlander. I've only been here 55 years and you know I understand those limitations. And um but where it said Vermont lacked was diversity and inclusiveness. And we are the whitest state in the country. 98 point something percent. And part of this, if not a significant part, and I think it is, is that we need to draw people and we need to make sure that if we draw people and we draw companies with diverse employees, that they are comfortable here, that they know we stand for the right kinds of things. And um. Governor Scott has thrown the weight of his office behind this. Uh, he issued a proclamation of inclusion two years ago, and he has issued a, uh, twice a proclamation making the second week in May inclusion week. And we are lobbying him again uh, with all we can, all the force we can bring to have him do it. And of course, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek and that he's got a lot to do. It comes at a very busy time. We understand that, and um, but we still hope we can get, get through and get him to do it again. Um, the, uh, we have, Bob said, 93 towns and close to 60% of the population. Not a town has turned us down, uh, thank goodness. And I don't wanna be the first. <laughs> um, and it's just been an incredible uh, adventure for the three of us. We knew each other, but now, you know, two hours don't go by where we're not in touch every day of the week. At, 
At first we said it wasn't a job, but it's become that and, and one we enjoy. Um, I, I'm not sure what else I can tell you. Uh, the really one other thing I guess I should say is that um, there are two phases to this. One is adopting the declaration and then putting its thoughts into practice, which we have called implementation. And um, so we're available to help with that. There are resources statewide and local or regional to help. And, you know, don't be gun shy about it because it can work and it could be some very simple fundamental things. And then it can be more long range. And, you know, we welcome you, encourage you to do it all. And we'll try to help and guide you to where you can get help if you need it. So I'll, I, I just want to say one thing, other thing, if I may. I wanted to commend Mr. Uh, Mr. Conti. I had several conversations with him, and he is an incredibly uh, comfortable man to deal with, and you should be very proud. Thank you. So I'm Motion. done. Yes. <laughs> Motion on this? A, a motion to accept the declaration of inclusion with some potential language change. Such as? Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, um, it's it's too bad that we have to, uh, to um, formally condemn things that I think humanity should uh, just be automatically uh, doing. And certainly I'd like to defend Berlin and my neighbors and Vermont in my state to say that uh, it's, uh, it's a rarity for me to see any non-inclusive behavior or attitudes. Uh, I've had exceptional neighbors, regardless of political orientation or party or, or race, gender, creed, or anything else listed here. So I, I want to defend Vermont and Berlin a bit. With that said, I do support um, this opportunity to signal uh, our virtue here in Berlin and uh, Vermont by doing this. And uh, I do support uh, a statement of inclusion, although I wish we didn't have to do it, period. So. Oh, well, the language changes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, the town of, and I think most of it is absolutely excellent. I wanted to expand it a little bit, really, uh, mostly, and put a couple just minor word changes that um, take some ambiguity away from uh, from the statement. Uh, the town of Ber my my suggestion is the town of Berlin condemns racism and welcomes all persons, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, legal, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression. Uh, so legal is a, is a change. Um, age, health or vaccination status, or disability, uh, health and vaccination status is an addition, or disability, and wants everyone to be rather than feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all its forms and commit to, and uh, my change was uh, just instead of fair. Fair is a, a relative word um, and subject to opinion. And equal treatment of everyone in our community legally, I added legally, and will strive to ensure all actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. I'm, I'm absolutely in support of this. I wish our town, and I don't think our town, and I wish our state, and I don't think our state needs to do this and have and say this out loud. I wish it was just part of our humanity, but uh, I'm in support of it with those changes. I'd second that motion. Any discussion from the any discussion on this? Uh, the word changes. I, I just, there was one word I thought I missed in the second paragraph. Did you insert the word legal somewhere? I, I legally, think. yeah. Everyone in our community legally was the only uh, addition okay. I made. Yeah. yeah.
And it was health and a vaccination? Vaccination status, correct. Mm -hmm. As we noticed a couple years ago, there was a bit of discrimination specifically on that issue, in my opinion. What are your thoughts, folks, in terms of us, if we were to approve it with those language changes? Have you had other towns do that? Or is your preference that it be identical to your what you presented to us to review? We, of course, would like it to be as close to what we presented as possible. Um, other towns have changed it. That decision is up to them, I think. Uh, only one town we had some strong exceptions to, and you don't come close. If I did it, if I was going to make a change, would I make these changes? Not all of them, but uh, I think my buddies will spill, speak to me if you adopt it this way. <laughs> may cost me a couple rounds of drinks, but you know. <laughs> And did you say you have 93 other towns that have accepted? Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor as it was presented by Carl? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Could you send me a signed copy, please? Just email it to me. Mr. Conti could do it. Yes. So we oh, yeah. Have it. And yep. once we have the signed copy, we will add you to the list. Uh, and you can see it on uh, Vermont Declaration of Inclusion org, VT Declaration of Inclusion. There's two places where there's lists, and we'll be delighted to add it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Mr. Conti. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, our, Good night. Our, Good night. Good night. RFP for police network assessment and approval. Yes. So I've been working with us. Uh, RB Technologies, as you know, they did their complete system change out over here. And to get the quote for the system change out in the piece uh, and to update there is kind of a top cop system put together over there. Um, they, they looked at it and said before they can finalize their quote, they, they basically need to come in and do a full assessment uh, because there's been a lot of hands in it over there. There's a lot of things, it's, it's a wiring issue, they need to trace out to understand exactly um, what they need to do and how they need to interface with the state as well on some of the requirements. That's what this is. Um, copy of it in your package. Um, but but that's what this is. This is they have to do this before they can design the appropriate system to go over there correctly. So well, this is their this is, the assessment is the two thousand one hundred twenty five dollars. That's correct. Will this be going into the police budget or capital budget? No, uh, this wasn't not budgeted for. And we uh, we already approved the, the ARPA funds for the computer system change. Um, this came after that, unfortunately, because they didn't realize until they looked the number of issues that are over there and the, the old equipment. Um, so they need to really figure out what's the, the best system they can design to meet the needs over there. There's one thing on page seven that I know under limitation of liability. It's the second sentence, the total liability of RB technologies for such damages will be limited and will not exceed $1 million, $1 million per claim and or $2 million. And then just in parentheses, that would need to be changed to be $2 million. Yeah. Okay. And just to make you aware, a lot of the computers that the police are using are eight years or older, most all of them. I think that the nine years I've been here, we've replaced one computer. Again, one of the things in the conversation with them that we discovered with RB Tech is they do have the ability to switch 
from the ADF system that they're using for email through the state and whatnot. Um, based on the equipment that's installed, they could actually come, come over through our .gov email addresses as well, and there'll be a reduced cost. Again, it'll be small, but there'll be a reduced cost not having to use ADS um, for that service. And where was the 2125 coming from? Well, my suggestion is going to be that's why we left some money in our book. Surprises like this. And that's not necessarily uh, into account there coming here. They, they're not going to be able to do all this remotely. No, they have to come here. They have to come here. Inspection as well. Um, and so they do have something in there for, for lodging and meals um, and mileage as well. Yeah. And do we know how many trips they might be taking here? It's just no. it's an unknown. Uh, yeah. That, I'm not sure. I did. I read, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I read it over and I thought that was mostly for out of state to travel and not necessarily since they're local coming in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they did note a 20% discount for being an existing client yep. as well. Yep. You know, another example they found just initially there's supposed to be two lines coming into the building that are separate one for them, one for this side of the building. That's not the case, and that's a problem. Um, so again, there's things like that. They, they just got to map it out, see where all the problems are, make sure they don't repeat any problems, and, and basically rebuild the system from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Will it be cheaper just taking got it and start new, or is it going to be? That's that's just about where we're at now. Um, again, a big portion of this is they have to understand from these guys what are the state requirements and get those clear. Um, when they lay out the equipment and the server and how it all really places as well. So. You took care of that. So that that's, the, that's the intent of this. Basically. Yeah. Any thoughts? I move that we accept the network assessment for the Berlin PD from RB Technologies uh, using ARPA funds. So, pay for it. Here a second. I would just add in the amount of $2,125, and I second it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, the water asset management plan. Yeah, we have a copy of both those. They're both with the state revolving loan program uh, for grants from Diane's favorite. <laughs> they are 100% um, uh, uh, funding. Uh, there's no match required for these. Um, and they're, again, uh, to develop a water asset management plan. And the other one is for the design phase of the uh, Scott Hill Loop. Can you one. say how much each one of them is for? Uh, yeah, I can tell you the amounts. For the uh, water asset management, it's $41,745. For the Scott Hill Loop. It's $51,430. And, and in those dollars are also um, something that we're starting to capture now is 10% for admin fees as well for the staff. So, of course, managing it. So these both these plans are uh, grants. They are. Hear a motion on this? Or at least the water asset management plan. I move to accept the water asset management plan. 
Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And then the Scott Hill loop design. I make the motion to approve the Scott Hill loop design and permitting 100% finding it funding application in the amount of $51,430. Second that, sir. Any further discussion? I, I do have a question. Does uh, just approving the design and permitting doesn't commit us to uh, moving forward Correct. with it and any timeline, right? Correct. There's no timeline associated with that. Okay. Okay. It's just to establish the plan. That was my only question. Good question. Any other discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, the highway equipment truck bid acceptance approval. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is for the, well, again, just to, to reiterate, the, the truck that we ordered last year is finally in. They're putting the body on it. Wow. Um, and as we discussed, it's sitting at Allegiance. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> not getting a body put on it yet. I don't know when it will get down. It's physically in the state of Vermont. Yes. Out a facility that can do that. <laughs> um, this is a follow up to the discussion that we had during the budget season about moving forward with a with a truck. Uh, now using ARPA funds and the proposed budget passing. That's what this is. Should the proposed budget pass, we can have this truck with this amount, which is two eighty one twenty five. Oh, sorry, two eighty one twenty one twenty five cents. So. Uh, and that is uh, road ready, if I'm not mistaken, at that point. And again, the urgency on this one, call it an urgency, is right. They only have two left, or one now, one left. Uh, we want to want to get this in and, and get our name associated, tied to, tied to that truck, committed to that vehicle. Again, and they're willing to you know, work with us. Uh, Hold it until the budget passes as long as we have the board's approval to do so. Your motion. Move to accept the high, highway equipment truck bid from New Hampshire AP Fairfield of New Hampshire for $280,000. One hundred twenty-one dollars twenty-one twenty-five cents. There a second. Second. Any other discussion on this? So my only question is, and it makes no difference to me. We white the blue that we already have. Um, some. Does anybody care? Yeah. The question. Some we can get some it town. Some yeah, we can have it wrapped, or they will have the cab painted, and that's the other vehicles. Or we can just leave it white. But it'll be at an additional cost, obviously. Yes. How much additional cost? Final wraps probably. All pack in about thirty five hundred bucks to wrap it. I don't know what paint it comes. In the spirit of our recent proclamation, I believe we should accept it the color that it comes to. Well, that's term. perfectly fine. I'm just making sure. Yes. <laughs> we'll still take our sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just making sure that some. Some places like to stay color coordinated. That uh, would be all Would it make a difference in how you plow the roads? No. Okay. And it has become somewhat of a common practice now. This they get a little color matched because it's all you can get. I see a lot of towns with multiple colored trucks. So well, it's like I said, it's it's come to the point where you you get what you get and yeah, and you go with it. Unfortunately, are we going to be trading in a truck towards this as well? That has been yet to be determined. Um, they were in the process of talking with the dealer that they deal with, with the chassis to see if they would take it in on trade. Mm -hmm. Or there was the entertainment of that we sell it privately mm -hmm. at this town. Or depending on how things go, um, I was going to approach them because 
probably will be after town meeting by the time that Mike's truck comes. If they would be willing to take two trucks on trade in for the truck that we have currently at Allegiance. So it would be the 2015 and the 2017 trade them, and it would lower the cost of the truck that we've already currently have purchased through Allegiance that has been over. Well, it'll be over a year of waiting by the time we get it. So there's a few options to play out there as far as how that goes. As long as we don't trade in more trucks and we get back here on the... Yeah. I'm not going to go down that road again. So what this is, is it'll be this 10-wheeler will replace the six-wheeler, which will, up, well, all, all the trucks will be 10-wheelers. Um, it should speed up the salt route because that's what it's going to be replacing instead of having to come back and get loaded multiple times. One truck will be able to do the entire loop route. And then like we've had in the recent past, between springtime, we lost a truck for two months for mechanical failures, but they were working on it. Um, so that would add be an added, an added benefit to us to have another truck for usage during mud seasons. And then we've had a few breakdowns this winter that this would help contribute to keeping us moving a little faster. We've, we've juggled a few things. I've come in a few hours early, more earlier than the other guys to get almost 90% of my route done so they can have my truck <laughs> when I took something else and plowed with. So trying to keep the wheels moving. Right. Anything else on this? Thank you for being proactive. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, I'd like to add one more thing while uh, Tim is here for discussion as well. That is the Crosstown Road Coach. We wanted to talk about that a little bit. So we're to that point, or pretty close to that point, <laughs> the way the weather's been flipping and flopping. I don't really know when spring is going to come. Um, so I was wondering if we could get that part out of it as whether um, the board would be all right with me and Vince making the decision at the time to close the road during for our normal spring mud season um, without having, like last year, we ended up having waited for the meeting and then we were kind of a week late and it got tore up pretty good in the meantime of waiting for a meeting. So. I personally feel that it, that your judgment, you know, you're the professional, and that's no. the, that's the way I I feel about it. Yeah. Out of, out of curiosity, you have any sense of what mud season will be like this year? Is the frost down that far? I don't believe so. But I know we were moving some dirt out back of the house and had no problems with digging no, into it. You know, what I mean, the roads are going to be down in there a little bit, but I don't think they're in that deep. But yeah. That could also play in one of two ways. That could <laughs> that could make it bottomless, or it could dry out a lot faster. You know what I mean? Last year was astronomical for some towns, and we had it fairly easy, fairly easy. So, and it's it's been hit or miss. It's, it's uh, always like it's never the same spot. <laughs> so, uh, consensus on letting Tim and uh, Vince make the decision. I, I got a lot of input last year when I first got on the board about that issue because that was the big issue when I first got on. And, and the large majority of people, uh, especially those directly impacted, wanted it closed when it was muddy and, and, and unpassable. So I, I would trust uh, uh, your judgment and just to keep the board informed. And then one more to add, it hasn't happened since I've been here. But there was a year or two that they we didn't barricade it, but they closed Dot Hill. I'm sure, Brad, you remember. Yep. Due to the fact that the for some reason 
um, every other year, there's frost heaves. The frost heaves get astronomical up there. Um, this year, it almost seems like it's starting a little early, so I don't know if they're just going to maintain where they're at or if they're going to get out of control. Yeah. So that might be one more thing to just be on the radar for. Perhaps have uh, bumps ahead signs or something yeah, ready to go. You know what I mean? If nothing else. We have them, so yeah. it's just a matter of going and putting stakes up with the signs yeah. on. But yeah. just know one year they got so bad that the cars were bottoming out on them and they, they closed it to through, didn't block the road off, but they closed well, it to through traffic. Just tried to your own risk. Type yeah, thing. just tried to slow some of the traveling down on it. Yeah. Well, I would leave, uh, if the board's all right with it, I just say leave it up to the to Tim and Ned. I'm good with that. Me too, at their discretion. Absolutely. And okay. as Earl said, keeping us updated, as you always do. Okay, anything else on that? All set? Okay, uh, capital fire request for approval. Okay, again, in your in packet, it's something that was talked about in the past. Um, fire came in and gave a presentation, you'll find the, the budget in there, you'll find the, an MOU in there, and the, and the letter as well uh, that, was, that was sent out by that. And I'll let uh, either Joe or, or Matt provide uh, with us as well, if you're willing to uh, go into further detail for the board or answer any of your questions, guys. Sure. Matt, did you want to speak on that? I can if you'd like. Can you hear me okay? Yep. You guys have the mic. See you, Tim. Okay. There's, there's, there's quite the delay in the audio, so I, I, I apologize if I don't hear you when you interrupt. But if I'm understanding this correct, this is the uh, capital funding, the annual capital funding for the radio system. Uh, the Capital Fire Mutual Aid Radio System serves uh, pretty much all of Central Vermont, with the exception of Barrytown. Um, and it's now even extended over into the Mad River Valley covering uh, Warren Fire Department or Waitsfield. I can't remember. Um, it's a antiquated system held together currently by duct tape and bailing wire and a little bit of the bubble gum. And uh, the project that's being undertaken right now through uh, communications grants with uh, the state is to basically redo it and make it current, modern, and effective. The challenge is we can't do that without um, a true understanding and a plan for replacing it 20 years from now when it's being held together by duct tape, bailing wire, and a little bit of bubble gum. So this is a uh, plan that was put together by the former, um, of the, the fiscal part of it was put together by the former, uh, just retired town manager of Waterbury, who is a genius, and I wish I could talk him into running my personal finances. Um, he's made a ton of money because he likes making money for the town. So he put this together, and it's based partially on the grand list and partially on call volume. So it is a split um, funding mechanism so where we don't have, you know, the, the busiest places that it, it gives a good blend um, as far as who is paying uh, for the system. I don't think we pay anywhere near the most or the least, which generally makes me feel good about it. About it. I'm happy to, I guess, answer questions at this point. So I have a question if this is okay with the board. Go ahead. I have a question. It's usually off the wall question, but I have. But I see like the 10 year total for the town of Berlin is, is 65,693. Joe, you look like you know where I'm going with this. Um, yeah, I'm just throwing it out, an idea out there. If we had the actual funds to do that, could we pay 10 year volume right up front and be done with it for the next 10 years? done with it for the next 10 years would that be something that they'd be interested in that that would be interested in though be interested in that would be interested in 
I don't see why they wouldn't want to do that. Joe, you want to take this one? I, I think that it, 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 at least from my perspective, I don't think it would be a problem. It would just, um, I, I don't think they would mind. Um, doesn't seem like it would be to me. Who, who would we need to ask to get a, a clear, we need to ask to get a clear answer to that? And if the board would let, like to go that way, I'd be happy to reach out. I, I think that conversation would be probably best with um, Joe Allsworth and Paul Cerruti. Paul Cerruti. How would this be affected uh, overall based on all of the town in terms of the ones that do not approve it? How will that offset what Berlin would be built? That's one of my concerns. Matt, can you mute yourself, please? <laughs> I just muted it. Thanks. <laughs> In other words, if we were to pay the $65,693 up front under ARPA funds, would we still have additional costs if many of these towns do not approve? What we're finding is we're, we're finding more uh, communities actually joining, to tell you the truth, because so of the... Rebate? Because of their because of the radio systems that are out there currently. Um, and, and so, you know, this this was a presentation, I think you're still gonna find possibly, depending on uh, the people or the other communities that get involved with it, or you might find the community that will decide not to, okay? Um, and, and I'm not exactly sure how they're gonna be paying for their radio, um, radio communication, right? Um, I think there's going to be probably some slight adjustments throughout those 10, 10 so years. So, I also <laughs> don't think that they've met any resistance, at least as far as I know. Uh, everyone knows this is a kind of a catastrophe waiting to happen, that we've got to get this uh, fixed up. Yeah. And like Matt said earlier, um, you have... Uh, communities out in the valley, um, like it was either Moortown or um, right Warren, Warren, Warren Beachfield. Yeah, uh, those are new to the system, and so I believe it's the the MOU is something that was signed by the town back in nineteen seventy seven, I believe. And so this is kind of just a, uh, I guess, to, uh, an update, um, updated uh, document for the town to sign in on with um, also copies of the bylaws and such of Capital Fire. So. So I have a, a question about the Equalize Municipal Grand List formula. So we were getting, um, both our our grand list and our and our call volume is that what Matt said? Yeah. So um, obviously Berlin's population is much lower than Barry City, and uh, and we're so we're paying the same because of the grand list, grand list and volume of calls. They have the call the call volume. We have grand list. So I guess my next question is, how is this, if, if we were to do it in a lump sum payment, uh, would that go toward the fire department budget, looking like the fire department budget was going up 65,000 or the capital budget, which it seems like we hide a lot, and I'm not, I'm, I'm pro fire department, so I'm messing, but it seems like we hide a lot of police department, fire department, town vehicles and we throw it in the capital budget and it looks like our police budget is much lower even though we spent a ton in the capital budget on the police department or the fire department maybe um, where is it coming out of and where will it be found in the budget again I, i'm going to recommend the arpa funds right um that if if we use the arpa funds for the 10 years 
that's six thousand dollars we don't have to put in the budget over the next 10 years every year that, that's the way i'm looking at it so it would come out of our fund you can classify it as a capital expenditure expenditure so if you were to look at the fire department's budget you will see that line item and, and it's specific you know we have dispatching fees which we we pay annually somewhere around forty two thousand, I believe. And that, and that goes up. That goes up um, just with inflation, with call volume and all. That's what gets affected. Um, this number right here is, is, I don't necessarily think call volume's in there. I think it's just based off of, of the grand list. And there was probably another factor marked in there as well. But um, call volume goes on our dispatching piece. The $6,000 is a separate line item on the fire department's budget to show that number right there, which we wouldn't have control over either. So I guess my next question is, uh, who's holding the money? <laughs> if we write that check out of ARPA funds for $65,693, does it go into uh, a fire specific department. account for us, or is there? Yeah, fire department, right? I mean, uh, no, I would say, if, I would say, designated fund. It, it would probably be held here in escrow okay, so and then slowly okay. dispersed. That's what I would say. Okay, so as a reserve. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. How does that work? Is it does it start the money have to be by a certain it has date? To be, has to be obligated um, by the end of twenty twenty four. And spent by, I'll, I'll have to look at the spent by because I think you're absolutely well, right. Just I, we have to disperse it by the end of I think 2026. So so we couldn't hold it in reserve. We, that's you right for that duration. Then it come back to haunt us. Correct. We can't hold it. Can't in do that. We have to make the payment. You'd have to pay it to this pay capital full. mutual thing is paid in full. And it was it was go to it would go to the. Right. Right. Apple 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 reserve, Apple. yeah, mutual aid. Answer them. And that's the caveat I would hope for that if we did move forward paying in full up front for all those years, that it would be um, without any increase over that time, that depending on what happens with other towns. Correct. And make sure that mm -hmm. I think that that would just be a wise thing because it's a huge investment and it's a, it, it's good investment, um, no doubt in my mind. Yeah, because yeah, but we would have to figure out the accounting piece too. Correct. The money's got to be spent. That's yeah. That's you can't put it in. Bond. Yeah, I can't just you know. No. Create a category and make it back. Yeah. We're in good hands there. <laughs> Don't get the feds coming after us. That's all. I know. Mean. <laughs> I don't want them coming back looking for their money back. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Yes. I did just uh, speak with uh, Deputy Chief Allsworth. He has no uh, qualms about that. He said just make it clear that that was the intention and what the guardrails were and he didn't expect Capital Fire would have any uh, problems with that. Thank you. So I guess a motion on this to uh, for the Capital Fire request for approval. I make the motion to accept the Capital Fire request for approval from the town of Berlin in the amount of $65,693 for 10 years total to be kept at that cost, paid upfront through ARPA funds, dependent on research that Vince will do on our behalf. Let's second that. Any further discussion on this? Yeah, I, I guess just to, to be clear that there is uh, uh, a, an accounting regimen in place by capital and by the, uh, Capital fire mutual aid that you know will keep good track of the accounting of, of the month of the check we give them. So moved. I would I would think it would just be a uh, accounting uh, line in the uh, their budget. Well, you're talking yeah we're not talking your fire department no. we're talking Vermont right the mutual one oh right. okay 
Yeah. So that's different. So is there an organization with a bank account with accounting that that's we can write the check? Yeah, that's account. what we have to check. I have yeah. to check on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why it'd be to their benefit that if we did that in one, because if they put it just in, in any interest-bearing account, they're going to have more money at the end of the, the period than waiting for our money every year. So, yep. so, so we shouldn't have ever see any increase. I mean, you would think. Any other discussions on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, Transit-oriented development plan discussion. Yep. Real quickly, you'll see a, a letter of recommendation or support in there for this. Uh, and I'm just looking for the board to approval to carry that forward if they agree. And the description of the uh, of what that transit-oriented development is, it looks like in the in the package. Um, they're they're getting a the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. It's working with the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission um, on a on a grant that they've received for transient tra transit oriented development, um, basically. And I, I won't read all this uh, to you, um, but they're looking for municipalities that might be interested in sharing some of that grant money um, to link those systems or, or develop those type of transit, transit, struggle with that word tonight. The development master plans and such. Uh, what they're looking for is, uh, and again, you'll see the letter, but a statement of commitment from the municipal body, municipal body to work collaboratively with the CDRPC consultant uh, to develop a, a TOD master plan, uh, a, a brief description of anticipated TOD planning, um, summary of previous land use, transportation, and other planning efforts. Uh, the project manager uh, had a rough estimate of staff hours and such. So I worked with the uh, support to put that all together. Um, we've had the preliminary review by the CB Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission with regards to that. They're okay with that. Again, it's just looking for the board's approval to uh, move forward and participate in that grant process. I'm in favor of moving forward, but I noticed that the letter of commitment was due by January 20th, 2023. Is there an issue with that, that no, we're over we're, that? We are covered because they gave them a draft prior nice. uh, to that date for their comments. Thank you. We just we need the, the formal approval or or not. And I can just say, no, we're not. We've decided not to participate. I think we as a town in Berlin uh, are at a uh, good this is a good opportunity for us. And Tom Badowski is very knowledgeable and great with the grants and has the background and the knowledge. I think this would be um, time well spent. So will there be a discussion of uh, uh, like prior to grant, sometimes grants require certain uh, limitations on uh, development, and this may uh, receiving a grant uh, in accordance with this memorandum of understanding may um, limit our ability to develop in ways that aren't recommended by the grant. Do you think, uh, you know, as at a first and second glance of this, I, I'm not quite sure if. Uh, I, I want I want to be sure that it opens doors, it doesn't close doors for future development in Berlin in non um, yeah, I, I'm not aware POD. of any any negative impl implications for the for the development in the in the town from this. That doesn't mean there isn't any. I'm just not aware of any from what I've been involved with and seen so far. It just actually opens up some relaxes some requirements in some areas for some of this transit. And it sounds to me as if it opens up uh, collaboration. The paragraph on the last page, page four, the CCRPC will procure consultants and develop the TOD master plans and bylaw development regulations. CCRPC will work with the CDRPC 
and each participating municipality to best match consultants with your local needs. Yeah, and this is this is more towards the planning end of things for the communities that are involved with us, you know, to link and develop um, a strategy and a plan for this for the tra improved transit. Mm -hmm. Ideas and systems, including rail. Rail is rail is a big one on here. Rail, bus, bike. Um, a lot of those things are never looked at, in my understanding, in this plan. Would there be any work prior to early 2024, based on what this outline? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So the, the basic thrust of this is to make it uh, walkable between communities and everything else for public transit. Yeah, mm -hmm. public transit. Mm -hmm. yeah. improved bus. It's not only accessible, but you know the rail. They're looking mm -hmm. at rail, commuter rail, pedestrian, uh, yeah. bike, an overall plan to connect communities. I got you. Mm -hmm. And there are two ways to do it, and that's what that's what I was getting at. One is to be more flexible to allow development in such a way that connects public transportation, and the second is to disallow things that don't fit into the uh, good TOD um, mm -hmm. type of development. So I'm very much for opening to allow that, and very much against preventing non-TOD development uh, on, on private private land and, and private and land. I think I think the crux of this is not more about implementation and building but about the planning of where and, and when it happens mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what really mm -hmm. more about the what mm -hmm. yeah uh, a motion on this I make the motion to to move forward with the transit oriented development plan as presented um, to us this evening. You have a second? Second that. Any other discussion on this? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Um, motion carries. Um, liquor license approval for Shaw's. Uh, again, of course, permission to interject here. We, we got a couple more come in. Um, this event was put out. For the price chopper and for Jolly as well. Also, just to make a more aware, on um, July of last year, it's the, the state has changed the rules. It's not just the licenses now as well, it's tobacco as well. So you'll see those in the package as well. You won't see these. These are the new ones that did come in actually today um, that I wanted to get in there. And these are all for Jolly, as mentioned. So, and there's also tobacco substitute, which is the, the vaping. So those are. So these are all just renewals. There's one new one, and that's with Jolly for the uh, vape, vape, or what do they call it, trans uh, tobacco alternative or substitute. That's the only new one in the package. The rest are all tobacco substitute endorsement. The rest are all re our renewals, and I did speak with the chief um, as far as any of the uh, liquor stuff goes, and there's, there's got no issues with any of those. I make the motion to approve the tobacco license application renewal. The requester is Brockton Corporation, type is tobacco license. It's a renewal, and the location is Shaw's Pain Fern Fight. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And what was the other one? The other one is we have uh, the liquor jolly. copper and jolly. I show the liquor license. Yeah. You're more in tobacco, right? 
I make the motion to approve the Price Chopper Operating Company of Vermont Inc. Second Class Light Liquor License. It's a renewal location is Price Chopper. All second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? All right. All right. All right. And I think we did the tobacco license for Brock Incorporation, not the liquor license. We just put it on, right? I think there's a liquor license also. I did the liquor license. Did you do both? I didn't see both. I, I just thought, saw I the I thought liquor. you read tobacco. Tobacco, yeah. I think we didn't read the, the liquor. Mm, I, I had done it from this sheet, I thought, oh. but maybe. Mm -hmm. I know it's a little mm -hmm. confusing, all the different ones mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, I moved it aside because I thought you said rock and tobacco. Uh, so I, I'm going to I'm going to make this motion. Uh, I, I move that we approve the liquor license or reapprove it if we just voted, and the tobacco license for the Brockton Corporation uh, for the second class li liquor license renewal, and it's for Shaw's Pain Turnpike. Perfect. Second. Nice. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Hi. And uh, then it was Jolly. That's here. Yeah. We've got a stack of them here, huh? Yeah. What a decadent little town we have. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you want to do it? Well, or... No, I'll let you right. and do that one. All right. I make a motion to approve the liquor license. Uh, for Jolly Associates, LLC, second class liquor license, renewal. And that's for Jolly on River Street, Montpelier, 1097 US 302 in Berlin. Second. Is there anything about uh, tobacco? Yep. Alan? And a tobacco for the same. Jolly Associates, LLC. Renewal. And what's the other one? And one more there. And yeah. a new for River Street, Montpelier for vaping products. All from Jolly. Yep. I take it your motion is all approved. It, it is. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. And it looks as if on the uh, price chopper, that was for both two as well, second class liquor license and tobacco. So I'd make a motion to approve both the second class liquor license for renewal and the tobacco license for renewal. Here a second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Sure, Vince. I missed one item when we were talking about grants and things as well. I do have one more for um, for grants, revolution for the better connection grant. And what we're doing, or I should say, get Tom the credit with Tom's doing is talking for two grants, one of which we want to get potentially if we get any. <laughs> and again, even if we get it, doesn't mean we have to execute it. <laughs> and this is a resolution that's required. Uh, for the grants, and it's uh, <clears throat> I'll let you read the resolution. It's probably easier than me trying to. And that one will need to be signed if the board approves it. Um, and along with that is the information. And this is in uh, this was is. It's a combination of the rec committee and the planning committee together. Um, and these are a description. This is a description of it and, the, and how the funding breaks down uh, for those. And the Berlin Trail work plan document that was prepared by them together as well. So one grant is, uh, I mean, the total of the grant is 75000 with a $7,500 match match <clears throat> and that's how it breaks down as well look forward to look we'll read that in the record. i make the motion to approve the resolution for better connections grant whereas the municipality of the town of berlin is applying for funding as provided for in the fy 2023 to 2024 budget and may receive an award of funds under said provisions and whereas the Agency of Transportation and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development may offer a grant agreement to this municipality for said funding, and whereas the municipality is maintaining its efforts to provide local funds for planning purposes, or the municipality has voted at an annual or special meeting to provide local funds for planning purposes, 
Now, therefore, be it resolved, one, that the legislative body of this municipality enters into and agrees to the requirements and obligations of this grant program, including a commitment to provide a cash match of 10% of the project cost, two, that the Municipality Planning Commission recommends applying for said grant, um, signed by Carla Nuizo, number three, that Thomas J. Badowski, Assistant Town Administrator, is hereby designated as the local project manager, a person with the overall administrative responsibility for the Better Connections program activities related to the application and any subsequent grant agreement provisions past the sixth day of February, 2023, by our legislative body of the select board. Your second. Second. Any discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, Thank you. I have that stuff in my hand. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Approval of licenses, permits, vouchers, and applications, payroll warrant. I make the motion to approve the payroll warrant 23-16 for payroll from January 15th, 2023 to January 28th, 2023, paid on February 1st, 2023, in the amount of $64,885.50. Payable warrant 23G14 with check 22652 to 22703 for payables in the amount of $157,941.65, the January 2023 general journal entries, and the January reconciled bank statements for the general fund and sewer water division. Your second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Approval of January 16th, 2023 minutes. I'm going to pass on this only because I haven't had a chance to read them in uh, their entirety. But if someone else has and wants to. Yeah, that's going to be that I'm not present here, but I came in on that uh, because you'll see in there that we had a discussion. Yep. Yeah. In there. So, mm -hmm. so that'll need to be adjusted. Make a motion to approve the minutes from January 16th, 2023, with the uh, removal and removal of the not and not present by David Sawyer. Yes. Any here a second? A second. Any discussion on this? Up? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, round table flow. I don't have anything to see. Go. Um, I'm good. Thank you. Good. Uh, Carol. Mm -hmm. No, nothing for me. Dave. No, I don't have anything. Vince. Surprise. <laughs> Couple of things. Um, hope options tax. Um. I have the opportunity to talk with Raylene from, <laughs> help me remember earlier. I did, didn't I? Uh, Donna Barry, uh, uh, Mr. Green that does the podcast and, and, and such. Aired out. Does, uh, aired out. Aired out. Does some marketing. Came back to me. Um, she was kind of, she did a lot of marketing for for Barry uh, this year for their local options tax or their the last voting period. Um, throughout the year, worked with them, developed a program, did the marketing, and it passed the first time. Uh, I've reached out to see if they'd be interested in working with us between now and the next voting period for something similar. Um, if we could leverage what they did in Barrie here in Berlin, um, they're willing to do that. Um, what they did was they did certain campaigns each quarter, uh, and, it, and she gave me an estimated cost of about $700 per quarter um, to work with us to help roll it out and market that that program similar to what they did in Barry. Um, I told her I would uh, ask the board tonight for some uh, either approval to move forward in discussions with that um, and develop the plan 
to share with the board or not. So that's that's my request. Um, is that something that the board sees a benefit in to move forward with and, and use them uh, to help market this and, and get the information out there? They're even willing to uh, maybe have a board member come down, Joe, um, to talk about it, the benefits of the town and one of their podcasts and so on. You've got a face for radio, Joe, what can I say? Um, <laughs> podcast is not radio. Well, it can't. Um, it doesn't it, pass the truth. Uh, but um, so that that's one of my roundtable items is that. Uh, the second one is is probably a little more simple. Uh, the next meeting for, on a Monday is the 20th at the holiday. Just like the board's okay if they agree to move it to the Tuesday, the 21st uh, on that one, if they think that's okay. And then uh, we'll be going into an executive session for a contract discussion after the round table. Uh, so I, I have a question about Tuesdays. The, pod, uh, the marketing is the marketing on the aired out podcast. Is that specifically what it is? That uh, no, is they, that the they well, no, they they do some other things as well, and that's that's what I need to to talk to her about. See what they did. Uh, look at what they did for Barry. Um, you know, they did some surveys. Uh, they did some. Uh, uh, they put out some information in a number of different ways, and I, I don't have all the details yet. Um, but that's what I'm entertaining uh, with the board's permission to see what that looked like um, and to see uh, at that point, if we want to bring her in for a full presentation of what we're going to get for the $700 a month um, after we do a preliminary look at it, see if it's worth moving forward with or not. I would be in favor of seeing a package that they can provide us and, and how they would approach it, et cetera, so that we could review it. 700 a quarter, did you say? A quarter. 700 a quarter. Quarter. Yeah. You just said 700 a month. And I'm just... Sorry, a uh, quarter. A quarter. It's a quarter. Um, That's the rough estimate, right? Until we have. I think there's nothing wrong with having her come in and, and presenting something. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll watch some of his podcasts, and, and they do focus a lot on Barry City. So I think that's that's why it probably worked so well. Sure. Um, that, that's kind of part of the questions that I've asked, though. So, because I, you know, they're good with Barry City, but how, how do you envision getting the information out to to Berlin residents mm -hmm. in a similar manner? Right. Mm -hmm. Those are those are the things that need to be discussed with her to see what that plan looks like. But I, again, if the board doesn't think it's worthwhile, then it, it stops here. If they do, then I will work with her over the next couple of weeks to have something ready uh, to bring back to the board to the next meeting so that we can move forward maybe after town meeting on it if it's worthwhile. You know, links to those podcasts can be easily put on websites. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He's got a good so, listener base throughout Central Vermont anyways because of his, you know, with Froggy and all that, all the years he spent doing that. So mm -hmm. it's, he's got a good listener base mm -hmm. in Central Vermont. Anything else, Vince? Or? That, that's... I'll be quiet for a few more minutes. I'm okay. fine with February 21st as well, but it's I don't know that it works for everyone. It's better for me. <laughs> I may or may not have skipped the meeting on the 20th to go to my son's basketball game. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 